the number of hypersonic flight tests that we've done as a nation over the past you know, five years, I mean, you can basically count them on two hands. And then you compare that to you know, what's happening in China and Russia, you need about 10x more hands uh, to, to do that same count. So the question now becomes, okay, how do we continue to maintain air superiority? What's the right technology set to do that? And our kind of thesis around that, you know, six and a half years ago when we started the company, at Hermes was speed. A Forbes Next Billion Dollar Startup List alum, Hermes focuses on a reusable and iterative approach for building the hardware necessary for Mach 5 aerospace and defense products. Our approach to aircraft development is very unique in the airplane world. There are not other companies that build prototypes at this rate um, and approach kind of systems engineering and program management the way that we do. And our approach to doing that has been build a technology roadmap that very quickly and iteratively de-risks the technology and at each step can spin off a product that solves a customer problem that unlocks customer dollars. And for Hermes's founder and CEO, AJ Piplica, the seeds of interest in hypersonic flight were sown during childhood. When I was a kid, I loved science fiction and building things. All the science fiction worlds, Star Trek, Star Wars, there's like one common thread that underpinned and enabled all of them. And it was things that moved and flew, whether in the atmosphere or through space. Then like, I went to an air show in middle school. I saw the C5 Galaxy fly. It's like the size of a building. Uh, and that broke my brain. And I think from, from there on, it was like, all right, I, wanna, I need to work on things that fly. His love for physics and aviation landed Piplica at Georgia Tech. I didn't come from like a, an aerospace family or anything like that. And I get into like my first intro to aerospace engineering class and the professor's like, all right, everybody write down your three favorite airplanes. And I'm like, I can't even list one. Like, what am I doing here? Despite a rocky start, Piplica found his footing, excelling in math and physics, and landing a co-op at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I loved aerodynamics, but I also liked space, and there's not much for an aerodynamicist to do in space. It's a vacuum, so it's like rocket engines or re-entry. Um, so I ended up on the re-entry side, but I also like, I was fundamentally more connected or driven towards airplanes than, than space. There was just like some stronger human connection. I didn't want to spend my career kind of trying to squeeze the last like 10th of percent of performance out of something that had been worked on for 30 years or more, um, I wanted to go like explore. Piplica's deep interest in hypersonics fueled his undergraduate and graduate studies, ultimately leading him to a position at an aerospace design firm in Atlanta. I really got to dig into a lot of the technology areas and more importantly, I got to know and develop relationships with a lot of the core people who, you know, 10 years later are now the leaders, um, you know, on the, on the DOD civilian side, um, really charged with, with driving and adopting this technology set. Among the people he met were his future Hermes co-founders, Skylar Shuford, Glenn Case, and Michael Sameda. We saw the military applications. We also saw that from a technology perspective, you could do this without having to do a bunch of science. You can solve a set of hard engineering problems, but not need to invent new engines, new materials, you know, new things like that. They're near-term problems you can solve in defense um, to actually like build a real company um, before you're trying to go after the uh, kind of commercial applications. The group banded together and founded Hermes in 2018. Their mission, to radically accelerate aviation. Nobody is really working on bringing reusability to hypersonics. And we thought that was really the key to making them cost effective and then therefore actually scalable. It's not just like, how do I solve the technical challenges? Um, it's how do I finance solving the technical challenges? You have to really bring those two things together. And frankly, I think the financing challenges are harder than the technical ones. Venture capital was a viable funding path. So we, we knew from the very beginning, like we want to privately fund this because that gives us the capital and the freedom to move the way that we want to, the pace that we want to versus, you know, kind of having to uh, ask the government to, to fund all the development. Piplica's pursuit of venture capital funding proved successful when he connected with billionaire Vinod Kosla in 2019. It's funny, in the email he said, we are probably a little too early for venture, but I'd love to pick your brain. I said, sure. I loved AJ and I loved the idea of Mach 5 flight and I loved his strategy. And I uh, got my partner Sven involved and we had a great meeting. In literally a month or two, we had a term sheet signed. What's really exciting is this is a very dynamic company. Defense has always been done the old way, if I might, the military industrial complex. Everything gets paid for by the military well in advance of even development of products. Nobody offers them a product to buy. They offer them research projects to go develop a capability, 
use lots of government dollars, you're incented to make it as expensive as possible. The, the new way is to develop a capability and offer it and do it very rapidly. So I was aware of Hermius when I was at Anduril. Um, they were young, they were small. The biggest thing that caught my eyes when they did their Series B raise, they did a $100 million Series B. And so for a hardware company, that's a big indicator, right? Like you need money to do this and seeing them raise $100 million and who they raised it from was very important. In 2022, Pipplica brought on Zach Shore, who had worked in the business development side of defense tech firm Andril. Making the decision to uh, to kind of you know hire your, your first salesperson, um, most companies would like wait till you had a product <laughs> to do that. It wasn't just sales talent that Shore added to the team. He also offered invaluable military experience. When I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to business school, and my focus was, you know, where the, the intersection of the military and national security, which is kind of a an interesting space. Historically, that had really just been the Lockheed Martins, the Boeings of the world. There wasn't a lot of interesting work going on, let's say, in like 2010. There are not a lot of companies in the venture back world that are working on problems of the scale and impact as Hermes on the hardware side. And so for me, taking the lessons of Andrew, the experience in the Marine Corps and in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and being able to apply it to a problem like this in a moment in time, geopolitically, was sort of like a perfect storm. For decades, dating back to the mid 20th century, speed reigned supreme in aircraft technology. However, the 1980s saw a shift, with stealth becoming the priority and speed development taking a back seat. That dynamic, though, is changing. It was a thing that I think AJ and the founders really understood was that speed was, was really in vogue again. The advantages of stealth are waning. Um, we're able to, you know, with, with modern electronics, um, software, um, artificial intelligence, neural networks, all these things, um, you layer these things together with more and more power pumped into radars and like, turns out you can, you can do a lot more with counter stealth than, than you can with stealth. So the advantage of stealth isn't growing now the way, the way it used to. The products that we're building, you know, not only are they disruptive in the way that they're being developed and the pace that they're being developed, but the capabilities that they bring to the warfighter are also not in a, in a swim lane that people have really thought of before. Getting that idea incepted into the very earliest stages of how our customer thinks about solving their own problems takes an immense amount of time. And that's where bringing in somebody like Zach in the early stages of the company, in the early part of our Series B, was so critical. He had done this at Andrel. He had, he had stood up new lines, new programs, created this customer understanding of not just their own solutions, but their own problems in a better way than they had understood before. Who is the customer? The customer is Congress, the, the, the people who control the money. The customer is the Department of Defense, the United States Air Force. My job is to go talk to the decision makers, talk to the problem owners, and explain what we're building, uh, why we're building it, and build a relationship where it says, hey, I, I also know, want to know from you if you want it to do this or you want it to do that. Like, we can customize this product for you at effectively no cost at this phase so that you can consume it later, you can purchase it later. This is a huge element of like having private capital um, to do your product development. You can withstand a wide array of different kind of ups and downs, whether it's government funding cycles or administration priorities. At the end of the day, it's about winning or deterring wars. And that means like Americans are putting their lives on the line. So if you go in and sell something that is so pie in the sky, you're actually not credible. The, the key military uh, feature that you get out of high-speed airplanes is survivability. And you get that through speed, altitude, and maneuverability. Those three things together give you a number of kind of physics-based knobs that you can turn to deal with a wide range of, of threats that, that might try to deny you access to a particular airspace. The faster you fly, the harder you are to shoot down, the quicker that you can kind of take actions, those kinds of things. You know, you can, uh, if you can you know, play five chess moves in the time your adversary is doing one, then like, you're probably gonna win. So how do you build a hypersonic airplane quickly? Forbes visited Hermes' headquarters in Atlanta to find out. No shortage of noises in a factory. <laughs> it all starts with the engine. So this is the, our first prototype of the Chimera engine. So this engine can operate from not moving on the ground to Mach 4 to 5 at 80 to 100,000 feet. And it does it by uh, pushing the, the gas turbine in the middle up to about Mach 3. And then at that point, a couple doors up here close, directs all the flow that's coming into the engine around and straight into the afterburner ramjet, um, runs it, and then the ramjet runs from Mach 3 and up. Um, and we do that transition of closing these doors and lighting the ram burner and everything in about five seconds. So it's, uh, if you've ever seen the new Top Gun movie, uh, the part where at the beginning where he's like scratching his ramjet, this is what that does. 
In here, we've got all of the major subsystems for the aircraft from its avionics systems, all of its wiring and harnessing, power systems, hydraulic systems, control surface actuators, all the lines that you hear, you see over here, these are the exact same run lengths as they'll be on the aircraft. So um, all the time constants for everything that, that everything the system sees is exactly what it sees on board the aircraft. Landing gear, all that. So we were able to here put everything together first, find all the problems that come up when you integrate things together, which is where all your problems are and usually where the biggest schedule drivers in a program come from. So do that in parallel with the airframe build, um, where like we've got a lot of certainty on like what the subsystems are gonna be, what the specific parts are. We've got all the hardware here, let's get it together, get it working, um, and then go integrate it to the aircraft. And um, some companies do this, some don't, but this is a huge learning that, that we saw from what we did you know, with, with Mark One that uh, has allowed us to, I think, accelerate and reduce risk for, for Mark Two pretty quickly. But according to Piplica, the best way to learn is to test. So this is Quarter Horse Mark Zero. It's the first full-scale vehicle that we built. Um, it's about the same size as our first flight vehicle, Mark Quarter Horse Mark One, um, and its purpose was really to get through a full rep at um, full systems integration, build, and test. Um, so it had all the subsystems that you need in an airplane, other than wings and control surfaces. Um, so engine, hydraulic systems, fluid systems, fuel systems, uh, electronics, avionics, power, all those types of things, RF, um, and it got us a full rep at operating the system on an Air Force base, on a taxiway, on a runway um, that we lose to, number one, yes, develop the subsystems, but more importantly, develop the team. Finding a team capable of grasping Hermes's unique approaches required Piplica to pursue talent outside of the traditional aviation pool. There's nowhere in the world where we can go hire people who have developed airplanes at a one per year cadence. It just doesn't exist anymore. Maybe if I had a time machine to go back to uh, you know, the 1950s, it could do that, but um, that doesn't exist in the airplane world, so we had to build it. Um, where it does exist is in the rocket world and the satellite world. So you know, having the opportunity to bring people who have had that type of complex systems development experience at that cadence and from that hardware-rich iterative perspective and give them an airplane program they can cut their teeth on, same kind of, uh, kind of talent development crucible for you know, early career folks who are coming out of school or coming out of you know, the existing airplane industry, like, okay, jump in and show us what you can do. Though Hermes has reported a valuation of more than $500 million, the company has faced criticism. Skeptics have dismissed its objective of hypersonic travel as unrealistic. I, I think when you are trying to do something that nobody has successfully done before and a lot of people have tried, um, there will always be healthy skepticism. And I, I actually like, I kind of like it because I think it helps keep, uh, keep us honest um, and keep us focused. But um, I think the, the way that you deal with skepticism is you show up and deliver. Like, I really actually like don't like talking about how we're going to do something. I much more like talking about this is what we did and how we did and what it means. We're going to do something that's fast and high. And that is an area that nobody's working on. The analysis shows it's very survivable. It's low, relatively low cost. And everybody has been going left and we have gone right. And so for us, being sort of a first mover in that space, using private capital to start that process ahead of everybody else also gives us uh, a lead time. So if we can continue to hit our milestones, if we can fly fast successfully and get capabilities to the field, we have the potential to really show that going right was the correct decision. The next milestone Hermes hoped to hit was flying their Mark I aircraft. It's pretty a specific set of, of risks that we're going after that unlock the next stages of our, of our roadmap. But um, the like success criteria are, are quite simple. It's literally like take off and land. And like, if the landing kind of isn't great, we got the data that we needed to, to learn and move on and, and iterate quickly. The thing I, I actually look forward to most though is, is more like seeing the looks on the faces of everybody who's put their blood, sweat and tears into, into making this a reality. Um, and you're really, uh, really hoping they feel uh, the, the kind of pride and joy that comes with whatever the, out, whatever the outcome is. On May 21st, 2025, Piplica got his wish as Hermes tested their quarter horse Mark I for its first flight at Edwards Air Force Base in California. Airborne. This test now lays the groundwork for building an uncrewed high-speed aircraft for the U.S. Department of Defense. This is actually, historically, how you've seen the most powerful technologies come to the commercial market is it's almost always adopted by the Department of Defense first. They're willing to take the risk. When you take technical risk, you find the boundaries, you find what actually matters and what doesn't, what the right problems to solve are, and then you go solve those problems. And analysis will almost never tell you that. We are able to radically de-risk the, the core subsystems around high-speed flight 
in an unmanned environment with a customer before we get to commercial. And so it's very intentional that we're solving these com these, these problems for the nation because it is great for America. Um, it's great for the allies. It's also great for us and it's great for the commercial market because we are able to advance this technology so that we can then unveil it into a commercial space. And eventually you're able to pull both free cash flow off of an existing business line that's growing and scaling um, as well as additional investor capital to put together the you know billions that are necessary and um, to, to bring a commercial passenger aircraft uh, to market. For Piplica and his co-founders, building a commercial plane capable of carrying 20 passengers at hypersonic speed, five times faster than sound, or 3,850 miles per hour, was always the guiding vision. Concord, if you remember the, the supersonic passenger aircraft that flew decades ago, that aircraft flew right around Mach 2. And they figured it out from a technological perspective. Um, definitely spent more money than I think anybody expected, and it was more expensive to operate than anybody expected. So um, you know, it didn't achieve mass adoption, but it did fly for 30 years. When you really look at it, you say like, was Concorde a success or a failure? It, it died of old age. The last 50 years, been no real innovation. A little bit of change in fuel efficiency, but nothing fundamental. Uh, and I love the idea of London to New York in 90 minutes. Uh, it just, you could go to London for lunch from New York. As for what that hypersonic passenger plane ride across the Atlantic will feel like, Piplica has high hopes. I think it'll actually be a nice smooth ride. Plus the view. I mean, that, that makes up for anything. <laughs>